All right, so moving along with the theme of uh, baseline normalization of time frequency power. In this lecture, I want to discuss how to pick a baseline time window, what it means to have a baseline time window, um, and what are the implications of choosing not only the baseline time window, but also how you uh, baseline normalize across different conditions, uh, different experimental conditions. The important thing to keep in mind is that uh, baseline normalization does not change the time course of any of the data. The only thing that baseline normalization does is shift the y-axis. So it's going to change what values are zero, what values are negative, and what values are positive. Otherwise, uh, baseline normalization is not fundamentally changing the um, actual time series of activity. And so what I have in this um, little toy example here is an illustration of, uh, of the importance of, of interpreting your results relative to the baseline and knowing uh, which baseline period you've um, selected. So here you can see um, the same uh, so time course of uh, time frequency power, you know, these little five uh, time steps, um, choosing two different baselines. And you can see that these two different baselines uh, do not change the time course of the activity, all they do is shift everything uh, up or down on the y-axis. And so here are the time bin, so time bin 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here in this top illustration, I've selected the first time bin to be the baseline, and here the second time bin to be the baseline. And now where this makes a difference is that, um, for example, in time bin 3, do we call time bin 3 zero change in activity? Or is time bin 3 actually a, a negative power, so a suppression of power, reduced power? And the answer, of course, is that it's, it's neither and both at the same time. It really depends on your, uh, on your baseline. And so this is an important point to illustrate that once you do a baseline normalization, your interpretation of the results has to change because you can no longer speak of absolute levels of power, you can only speak about and interpret and also statistically analyze um, uh, relative changes uh, in power, so power relative to whatever you specified as the baseline. Um, and so, so you can have the same amount of power um, and interpret that either as zero change in power or a negative change in power, suppression of power, depending on what you pick as your baseline. So this is really a non-trivial issue. Um, here I have some examples of um, the same data, same electrodes, same analyses. The only difference between these, uh, amongst these three plots is which time period I used for the baseline normalization. Um, and we will reproduce this uh, figure in MATLAB in a few minutes. So here you can see I used a baseline uh, period of minus 500 milliseconds to minus 200, so that's from here to um, here. This one is minus 300 to zero, and this one is minus 100 to plus 200. Um, uh, I'll start with, with panel D first. Obviously, this is a ridiculous and obviously terrible choice for um, baseline activity because it includes post-stimulus uh, onset um, activity. But, you know, it's an extreme case that really um, uh, illustrates the point that if you, if you compare panel D to panel B, um, a lot of this post-stimulus activity is gone, and what you what it what appears to be happening instead is that you have this this really strong suppression of uh, of you know whatever this is upper theta, uh, theta to alpha activity um, in the pre-stimulus and post-stimulus period, but really this is not uh, or it's not really interpretable as a suppression. It's really just that the increase the post-stimulus increase in power. Uh, sort of leaked back into the pre-stimulus period and um, and made this a and con yeah changed this into a into a relative suppression. So obviously this is a terrible choice, but you know it's interesting to see these extreme cases to uh, to really sort of drive this point home. So there's a bit of a more subtle difference between panels B and C, and here you see they generally show similar. Uh, results. In panel B, you see a, a bit stronger um, theta response, this kind of sustained theta response that starts earlier. Uh, that's a bit more prominent here in panel B 
compared to here in panel C. And what's happening, you can see that a little bit of this power is leaking back before time zero. So this is an interesting situation. It is um, possible in your experiments, if you have a constant inner trial interval, um, or some kind of a pre-stimulus warning cue, that your subjects know exactly when the next um, stimulus is going to come on the screen, so they can kind of anticipate it, they start processing the stimulus already before it uh, comes on screen. That's a situation where you could get uh, a brain activity before time zero. Um, but I think what's more likely uh, in this case, what often happens is that um, activity that happens very quickly after time zero, because of the inherent uh, temporal smoothing properties of time frequency decomposition, um, some of the very early activity is going to leak into the pre-stimulus period. So this is temporal leakage. And probably what's happening here is that you know, the, the, in, in, in the actual brain, in the real experiment, there was an oscillatory response that began fairly early somewhere around here. And because of the um, temporal smoothing properties from the wavelet convolution, that kind of yeah, leaked a little bit into the pre-zero uh, time bin. And so then when the baseline goes all the way up to exactly time zero, we're actually including a little bit of this um, uh, post-stimulus activity into the baseline time window. And that pushes up the baseline power, and then uh, the um, task-related power seems to be relatively less. And in fact, you can also see a little bit of a suppression um, here, an apparent suppression, which you don't see here. And that's really just because a little bit of this um, kind of shoulder leakage is, uh, is bleeding into this uh, earlier activity. So for exactly this reason, because of the, um, uh, the decrease in temporal um, uh, precision and, and the temporal smoothing uh, um, resulting from time frequency analysis, particularly at lower frequencies, I think it's generally a good idea to, um, to have your baseline period not go all the way up to time zero, but instead to end a little bit uh, before time zero. So something like minus 500 to minus 200, here I wrote minus 400 to minus 200, something like this. Of course, um, the exact choice of the uh, baseline period depends a lot on the specific design of your experiment. And so, you know, uh, I, I couldn't say that you should always use minus 500 to minus 200 because that's not going to work for everyone and for every experiment. The point here is that you really need to think very carefully about what to use as your pre-stimulus uh, baseline period. Um, so let's switch over to MATLAB. I'm not going to go through all of this code line by line because most of it is, um, is, uh, is, is stuff that you've seen before. So here I'm going to um, choose a bunch of different uh, baseline time windows. And basically, we're going to be reproducing this plot that that, we, that I was just discussing in PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, here we specify the time windows. And you know, of course, I encourage you to change these numbers around. We're going to do four separate analyses using these four different baseline time windows. Um, and you can change these numbers to see what the effects are going to be. Here we set up our wavelet uh, um, uh, analysis properties. We're going to use channel 01. Uh, you can, of course, change um, any number of these uh, these parameters. Here's where we actually do the wavelet convolution. Of course, all this stuff looks familiar. You can see that we are not um, uh, actually changing um, any of the, we're not pre uh, performing any uh, normalization um, here in this plot uh, or in this code. Instead, all the normalization happens here. And here I'm going to compute uh, decibel uh, normalization and also time frequency power change. Um, so you can see um, both of these results. So let's see, I believe this one is just plotting uh, percent change. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, these are not exactly the same data that I showed in the uh, PowerPoint slide, but you get the, the idea. Um, so yeah, here again is this awful uh, um, choice of baseline, which is actually really the post-stimulus period. Of course, that obliterates the actual stimulus-related activity, and it puts all of this activity, or the inverse of all of this activity, into the baseline uh, and post-stimulus period.
let me see. Oh, this also does compute uh, decibel. So here in figure one, you see the decibel normalized, normalized results. Here in figure two, you see the percent change normalized results. Um, there are a few subtle differences between these. Um, most of the apparent differences between uh, percent change and, and decibel are actually related to the color scaling. So if you would change the color scaling here, you could actually get these two plots to, to match uh, even more than they already do. But the important point is that the percent change and decibel change are not really hugely different. It's enormously unlikely that you would come to completely different conclusions about what's happening in the brain based on using decibel or percent change. And for that reason, um, uh, unless you have really extreme values, it's, it doesn't really matter. You can choose decibel or percent change, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Um, so that is uh, basically all I wanted to say about um, the baseline time window. There is another issue related to baseline normalization that happens when you have multiple experimental conditions. And here the question is, should you um, um, compute the baseline power based on the condition average or uh, based on each condition uh, separately? And so here, imagine you have three time courses of some frequency band specific power for different conditions. Well, we could call this condition A or I guess condition red is a bit easier to remember. So here's the time frequency power for condition red, and this is raw values. This is not uh, doing any, any baseline normalization yet. And here's for condition yellow and condition blue. So you see um, that these conditions um, do differ in terms of their, uh, the amount of power that's elicited by the different conditions, um, but it seems like the, the phasic response to the stimulus onset is pretty much the same for the different conditions. And really what differs is that there is a, a kind of a tonic shift or a baseline shift between these different conditions. Now, depending on your experiment, this might be uh, related to noise, or maybe this is related to some meaningful um, thing. Let's say, you know, if subjects were in different, uh, I don't know, motivational situation contexts in these uh, different conditions, um, or maybe you have a, uh, you're looking at, at fatigue or something, and this was early in the experiment and middle in the experiment and late in the experiment, and then you see these tonic differences. So now, um, if you were, so now the question is, when you uh, apply a baseline normalization, so should you average these conditions together to get the baseline, uh, the estimate of the baseline activity, or should you baseline each condition um, relative to uh, its own uh, um, uh, baseline. And so there's there's actually no right answer here. If you would do a, a condition-specific baseline, then the results you would get would look something like this. And you would see, so I separated them here just so you don't think that I got lazy and only plotted one uh, line. But um, so, you know, here you see with a condition-specific baseline, you're removing this tonic offset across these three conditions. And then the conclusion you would arrive at is that all these conditions, or these three conditions, have the same, elicit the same uh, amount of time frequency power after time zero. In contrast, um, if you were to uh, use a condition average baseline, then you would see, so this line is, is reflecting uh, zero uh, decibel, um, then you would, you would preserve this condition difference in activity um, but then this would be, you know, you would have to be very careful not to interpret these differences as, as being related to phasic uh, differential responses to the stimulus, uh, but instead these differences reflecting tonic differences between these uh, conditions. So, uh, you know, which one is right? Uh, uh, you know, these are both correct uh, solutions. These are both appropriate and valid baseline normalization procedures, but they would give you different interpretations of the results. Um, so let me see. Um, uh, this is a, a fairly unusual situation where you would have such um, strong tonic uh, differences across the three different um, conditions. So um, in general, uh, I prefer doing condition average 
baseline. So you put all the conditions together um, and then you compute the baseline and then you apply that baseline to each individual condition. Um, I like this approach because um, it increases the signal to noise and you, you want to have as pure and high signal to noise estimate of the baseline power as you possibly can. And so to, to, to increase the signal to noise of the um, baseline, you want to average together more data, basically. So you put in longer time windows and you put all of your conditions together. Uh, that is why I generally tend to prefer a condition average baseline. Um, but uh, of course, that said, you know, there are uh, situa there's always some situation, there's always some experimental uh, design where the condition average baseline doesn't really make sense and the condition specific baseline does make more sense. Again, there's no right or wrong answer here, but it's important for you to think about this issue. This really has non-trivial um, uh, implications for uh, the kinds of interpretations of your results that you will make. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so it's something that you should um, think a lot of think think about very carefully. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the, okay. I have nothing else to say that I haven't already said.